Professor Wayne Ross of the Department of Curriculum, and Educa uh, Curriculum Studies in the Faculty of Education here at UBC. And, you know, here is an individual that, if or not for the teacher strike, I actually wouldn't have met. <laughs> and it's really a shame because we have so many interests in common in terms of we're both operating and designing online journals. We're both interested in the, in the role of labor and social equity and social justice in, the, in, work, in academic work sites. And it took uh, this major disruption and interjection in the political movement of this province to bring us together. And it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you uh, Dr. Wayne Ross. Thanks, Charles. <laughs> I'm going to be real quick. I've got three points, and I want to make sure folks have a chance to talk. But in, just for full di disclosure purposes, uh, I am a parent too. Uh, my son goes to Sir Richard McBride at 29th and Knight on the east side. Um, I'm a former daycare teacher and secondary social studies teacher, a 15-year member of the American Federation of Teachers, and uh, a few years shorter than that in the National Education Association. But I'm a professor of education, and that's kind of the role in which I was asked to talk tonight. And <clears throat> I want to say um, just three things, but I do have some sub points. <laughs> <laughs> the first is to ask the question, what kind of example rose teachers setting <laughs> when they went out on strike or engaged in civil disobedience or, or took part in a job action? That question was asked a lot. Uh, during those two weeks. Uh, what kind of message uh, indeed did the, did the teachers send students when they defied provincial law in the courts with an illegal strike? Are public school teachers bound to uphold all laws as an example of good citizenship for students, for the rest of the public? These are important questions. I think they beget another question. That question is, should everyone hold an unexamined faith in government? And I think the way in which you answer that question has an impact on how you respond to the first two. The teacher's walkout uh, provides all of us, and I think particularly uh, BC public school students, with an opportunity to consider the relationship between the government and the governed. So I'm echoing some remarks about the lessons, civic lessons that are, can be learned from this, this event. Education aimed at fostering a free society cannot succeed by merely extolling the uh, virtuous intentions of the state with every once in a while pointing out the anomalous errors that the state makes. Uh, I think that the dominant voice, the dominant narrative in the social studies curriculum in North America wants to, wants to convince, we want to convince everyone that, this, that the state is operating in our interests. But I think one of the significant outcomes of the strike is that it, in particular, that it, it brings to the forefront the issue of the politics of obedience, or what some people call the discourse of voluntary servitude. Why is it that people consent to governments that do not serve their interests? Uh, what is the ultimate source of political power in our society? On what bases are acts of civil disobedience justified? These are all crucial questions for us, and I think they're questions that foster thoughtful, critical, democratic citizenship and that are uh, key to making meaning out of the strike. So my first point is that there's some really good questions that have been raised and questions that we need to consider continuously. Second point is, and this has been made, uh, I'm going to give a name to something uh, that many people have already mentioned on this panel, and that is the strike was significant because it was a, uh, a significant point of resistance to what uh, I and many other folks would call neoliberal economic, uh, educational, and social policies that really dominate the framework of governments in, in the uh, developed world, in the, in the entire world, uh, particularly in North America. Neoliberalism is another name for global market liberalism. Um, things like the GATS, the, the General Agreement and Trade and Services, the, the IMF, the WTO, these are, these are um, uh, global financial um, mechanisms that uh, are shaping the actions, not just at the WTO, but that shape the actions at the national level, the regional level, and at the provincial level. Now, neoliberalism is not something that you sh should cons can, uh, confuse with kind of traditional political liberalism. 
that idea of broad-mindedness and tolerance because political liberals and political conservatives um, all subscribe, at least those that, have, that are in power, subscribe to um, the notion of uh, neoliberalism. In short, neoliberalism is, this, is an ideology that cre it creates a number of things, but it creates two kinds of policies that are particularly pertinent in this situation. First is it creates gaps between the rich and the poor, and it does this in, at the individual level and it does it at the national level. It also creates policies that, that, that uh, foster political systems in which there is a formal democracy but it's a democracy in which citizens, for the most part, remain spectators. They remain diverted away from uh, serious and meaningful involvement in decisions that affect their lives. Now, Robert McChesney, who's a professor at the University of Illinois, puts it this way. He describes neoliberal democracy like this, quote, trivial debate over minor issues by parties that basically pursue the same pro-business policies, regardless of formal differences in campaign debate. Democracy is permissible as long as the control of business is off limits to popular deliberation or change. In other words, so long as it's not democracy. Now, there, there are about, um, well, I'm going to talk about five, just name five basic principles of what I'm talking about with this idea of neoliberalism. It's the rule of the market. It's cutting public expenditures for social services it's deregulation, it's privatization, and it's the elimination of the concept of the public good or community. And in its place, what we have are individual responsibility and the pressuring, and pressuring of poor, the poorest people to find solutions to their lack of education, health care, et cetera. And I think you know, tonight we've seen examples of all five of these mentioned, and if you spend any time in BC, and I've lived here for almost two years now, um, I could give you uh, some good examples on each of those points, but in the interest of time, I won't. A depoliticized and apathetic citizenry is the key outcome of neoliberalism, and it is arguably abetted by so-called educational reforms that can be seen uh, in Canada and in BC, and they can be seen in spades in the United States. And I'll give you three examples. Uh, reforms that reduce learning to bits of information to be taught, learned, and tested. Uh, the marketizing education through programs that promote privatization and user fees in place of free public education, not just K-12, but uh, through university. Uh, policies or reforms that create curriculum standards where the state defines what is to be taught and systems of accountability or surveillance that enforce the teaching of official knowledge. Uh, in particular, the, that last point works to de-skill and deprofessionalize teachers and to produce um, outcomes like Kevin was talking about, the production not of uh, citizens but of consumers. And lastly, and I'm, this is amazingly fast, I can't believe this. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, I teach in three-hour time blocks. My dad's a minister. I've just, you know, it's just in me to keep going. But lastly, uh, the, the teacher's strike illustrates the degree to which a line can be drawn between the, um, the interests of the political and economic elite and the rest of us. Um, the strong public support for teachers as well as the high degree of labor solidarity, particularly among the rank and file members of um, the, uh, the, the unions in the BC Federation of Labor, and including in particular CUPE and the leadership of CUPE BC, um, I think really illustrates the keen understanding uh, uh, on the part of many, if not most, people in BC about just who they share interests with and who they don't share interests with. For me, this is significant because it's, a, it's the first step in organizing any kind of significant social, educational, or political transformation in any society. And it's also key in terms of resisting the politics of obedience and the ideologies that would undermine the ability of the majority to have a meaningful say in decisions about the issue, issues that matter the most to them. <laughs>